And when we talk about um, bridging the gap by doing things the other person's way, he's in his son's world and it's, it's excruciating that he's going to spend his last moments facing the cold facts of, I'm dying of cancer. I don't know that story, Dad. You never told me that one. And he says to his son, and they haven't really been able to connect this whole time, and he says, tell me what I saw. Tell me what I saw in the witch's eye. Hello, and welcome to Cinema Therapy. I'm Jonathan Decker, licensed therapist. I am Alan Seawright, unlicensed filmmaker. And with us today is Stephanie Goodman, who is a woman's advocate, and she is a children's book illustrator. So, Jackie of all trades, right? You do a lot of cool stuff. Well, you can definitely tell that I'm a creative person right there. <laughs> Good to have you on the show. And this is your spot. Like, we are invading your spot. Thank you for having us in your theater room. But it's a pleasure to have you guys here. You bring so much joy and, and magic to this room. And we're happy to share it with you. <laughs> and you and you share our dog. Why are you laughing? <laughs> we bring joy and magic everywhere. Yeah, we do. <laughs> like elves. I just like to smile. Smiling's my favorite. Make work your favorite. That's your favorite, okay? Okay. Work is your new favorite. And today we're talking about one of your favorite movies. We are. Which is? It is Big Fish. Big Fish, a story about a father who spins tall tales and the son who resents him for it. And so what we've got on theme here today is popcorn that is... Too good to be true. So let's test that. We've got, this is the Chicago mix. It's cheddar. And caramel. Cheddar and caramel. And over here we've got white chocolate. Is it too good to be true? Mm. White Chocolate is my karaoke stage name. Wake me up inside. Wake up. Did you know that? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh. That's dang good. I'm gonna delete that from the subconscious. No, you're not. No, you're not. That um, is amazing popcorn. So let's talk about Big Fish and why you love it so much and what it means to you. So I chose Big Fish because it is, it's a story of connection. It's a it's a storyteller's story. Mm -hmm. If you're a storyteller, you understand this concept of life can be boring, but you can really enrich it by by details. Yeah. That nobody thinks of that sometimes you don't know are true or fantasy. Yeah. They say when you meet the love of your life, time stops. And that's true. And I think that some level we all suffer with not being able to connect with somebody that we really look up to, somebody that we love. And mm -hmm. we, we just, we suffer that frustration of who are you? Mm -hmm. Why won't you let me into your real life? Yeah. People have their walls up, right? Definitely. So in this film, it's Billy Crudup. Is it Crudup or Crudup? I've heard it both ways. I don't know the pronunciation of his name. I'm gonna go with Crudup. <laughs> And, and up just go ahead and up. never Yo, crud up or shut up, all right? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, his father's dying of cancer. In his entire life, his father has just spun tall tales, right? When he tells his life story, they're so out there and unbelievable, and the son feels like he doesn't know his own father. And what's worse, everybody loves his dad. His dad is so charming, but he resents, my dad's about to die, and I don't even know who he is. Do you know your father? Everyone loves my father. He's a very likable guy. Avert that question. <laughs> yeah, totally diverted. You have to understand, when I was growing up, he was gone more than he was there. When I started thinking, him, maybe he's got this second life somewhere else. Another family, another house, and he leaves us and goes to them. Or, or. or maybe there is no second family. Maybe he never wanted a family. Whatever it is, he likes his second family. Maybe he never wanted a family. He's saying the reason he makes up all these stories is to escape the life he hates. Well, what's true? He's never told me a single true thing. Okay. I know why you like him. I know why everyone likes him. I need you to tell me that I'm not crazy. Mm. You're not. And I think you should talk to him. 
the interesting thing structurally about this is, you know, this film doesn't really have a protagonist and an antagonist, yeah. right? It's got a son who's who's arguably the protagonist, but he doesn't have anything that he's really fighting against. The dad is not a bad guy. No. The son is just upset with how the dad... Well, he takes a spotlight a lot of the times, yeah. especially out of his own life, where he's like, this should be my day. Right. And his dad's there telling stories and charming the guests and enter- entertaining people, and he feels like my dad puts himself out there to be beloved by everybody, but not here, not at home. What I love about this is a, as a couples therapist, I love, I always have, I love the marriages in this movie, and I, I love how she doesn't agree with him. But it's not true. I mean, this is something called being an affirmer. It's a conflict resolution style where you can agree to disagree, but you're also open to learning from one another's perspective and you don't need to be threatened by disagreement. So she says, I think his stories are charming. I think they're romantic. I think he's a real sweet guy. And he says, he is, he's very lovable. But look, I'm worried that he tells these stories because he never wanted us. Like he never wanted to be home. He never wanted this family. I don't know who my father is. And he doesn't say this, but I resent him because he's about to die. And we never really connected. We never had this connection. And then he says to her, I need you to tell me that I'm not crazy. And she reaches up and she caresses him and she says, you're not. And she doesn't agree with him, but she also recognizes that he doesn't need to be wrong for her to be right. That they can simply just coexist and see it differently. Yeah. Which is powerful in a relationship. Yeah, I mean, you've got, so we interviewed your husband a little while ago. He talked about Schindler's List. Oh. You've got a fantastic marriage. I love to watch you two together. I, I know hundreds of marriages. I know I've seen thousands of couples and you have this really beautiful union. So how does this speak to that? I mean, do you see your marriage in that at all? When you're married to your best friend, there are times that you don't completely agree, but you always want to validate their feelings. Like Kels will tell me all the time, your your words and actions tell me the truth. Mm-hmm. You know, you we may not agree on this, but I love you and that's more important. Yeah. For some reason, the people we are absolutely closest to, we crave their validation so much. I mean, we can take criticism in this world from just about anybody. Yeah. But when it comes from my husband Mm -hmm. and vice versa, if I'm criticizing him, it is the hardest to hear. And so I can empathize with him saying, tell me that I'm not crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think one of the things that, that she's doing here, too, is I don't even necessarily think that she disagrees with him and is validating him. I think she is just empathizing with him. I think she's yeah. seeing, look, from the outside, I'm looking at your dad, and he's a charming, wonderful, delightful guy. I see how he hurt you. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Oh. That's not, not he... wrong. Yeah. Like, these, both of these things coexist. He is a charming, wonderful person who everyone loves, and he hurt you, and I can see both of those things. Yeah. You're not crazy, but also maybe cut him some slack is kind of, you know, the yeah. message right. she's giving him. Because, because she's got this other perspective. So, yeah. yeah, that whole... And when she says, I think you should talk to him, she has faith that you guys can figure this out. Yeah. That I, ha- I have no idea who you are because you've never told me a single fact. I told you a thousand facts. Well, it's what I do. I tell stories. You tell... Lies, Dad. You tell amusing lies. Stories are what you tell a five-year-old at bedtime. They're not elaborate mythologies that you maintain when your son is 10 and 15 and 20 and 30. And I believed you. I I believed your story so much longer than I should have. And then when I realized, of course, that everything that you said was impossible, everything, I felt like a fool to have trusted you. You're like Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny combined, just as charming and just as fake. Ouch. You think I'm fake? Only on the surface, Dad, but it's all I've ever seen. Look, I'm about to have a kid of my own, and it would kill me if he went through his whole life never understanding me. It will kill you, huh? What do you want, Will? Who do you want me to be? Just yourself. Good, bad, everything. Just just show me who you are for once. 
I've been nothing but myself since the day I was born. And if you can't see that, it's your failing, not mine. Defensiveness. Mm -hmm. Which usually leads people to withdraw. I, I watch this and there's so much meat as a therapist. Mm. And I think part of the reason why I didn't personally do really any commentary during all of that is because if I were in a therapy session, which is what it felt like, I, it, yeah. I actually felt like I was observing this. And in a therapy session, I would let that play out because that gives me information about how they interact and how they resolve conflict. How we counter defensiveness in real life when, when we feel defensiveness rising up inside of us is to take ownership, right? And the dad doesn't have to say, I was wrong to tell tall tales, but he could say, you know what? I see that the way I am is hard for you, but I can see you feel like you don't know me. I'm telling you, this is me. This is me. This is who I am. I'm a storyteller. And that would have been a healthy way to approach that, but most people don't know that unless they learn it. Most right. people would do exactly what the dad did, which is, I've always been mean. If you can't see, that's You're your failing, failing, not mine. And of course, when we get defensive, it pushes people away and the sun just walks on out. Well, and I wonder too, as a storyteller, I look at my children and I want them to achieve certain things that, that either I did or that I didn't do, but I want them to have the opportunity. I know that he's trying to train him to be a storyteller mm. to take on his legacy. Mm -hmm. You know, he knows he's leaving this earth. What is he leaving behind? Well, and I find it interesting that, you know, the son, it's, it's not dwelt on very much, but he's a journalist, right? He's mm. a person who tells stories, but he tells truthful, fact-based stories. Yeah. Right. So yeah. He, he took some stuff from his dad, whether consciously or not, but he also, in doing so, spat in his father's face. You know, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's, I'm going to take everything that I learned from you, and I'm going to do it right. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I think this comes down to like a core personality difference. I mean, I see it as there's four personality types, dreamers, healers, closers, and thinkers. And so, and thinkers are very analytical, fact-based, direct, right? Uh, and then healers are very compassionate, like the, like the French wife would be a healer. Mm -hmm. Closers are get it done no matter what. And then dreamers are the father. Dreamers are entertainers. They're storytellers. My, I'm a dreamer by nature. I relate to this film because my wife will say when I'm telling a story to a group of friends, she will say to me, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Most men, they'll tell you stories straight through. It won't be complicated, but it won't be interesting either. <laughs> oh. And she doesn't mean it as a dig. She means, because because I'll, I'll embellish details I'm like about her and her reaction to something I did, and she's like, I, I didn't say that. I didn't, I didn't react that way. Because yeah, she's a story. thinker. She's very literal, right? Yeah. And what we'll see at the end of this film is bridging the gap between different personalities means I'm going to step outside of how I do things and try and do them the way you do things because I yeah. care enough to try. Huh. And when we talk about um, bridging the gap by doing things the other person's way, he's in his son's world and it's, it's excruciating that he's going to spend his last moments facing the cold facts of I'm dying of cancer. I don't know that story, Dad. You never told me that one. And he says to his son, and they haven't really been able to connect this whole time, and he says, tell me what I saw. Tell me what I saw in the witch's eye. Huh. That's a while ago. And it's so beautiful as his son steps out of this thinker personality and he steps fully into dreamer to comfort his father and let him go out the way he's always been, which is a storyteller. <laughs> and you were talking about the father has implicitly wanted his son to be a storyteller, you know, and the son hasn't done it. So no, like staunchly refused to do it. So it's uh, it's in the morning and you and I are in the hospital and I'm falling asleep in the chair and I wake up and I see you somehow you're better. Dad? You're uh, different. Dad. Let's get out of here. And I say, Dad, you're in no condition. Get that wheelchair. Well, this scene shows us that he has the storyteller in him, and it's a grand storyteller. And yeah. it comes to life, and it helps his father to have closure of 
who he is. You become who you believe that you are. Yeah. So in a sense, he he becomes like his father, even though he's still himself. Like he he, he bridges that gap. There's peace in that. And uh, as we get as we get close to the river. <laughs> favorite car that had mm -hmm. been restored somebody is already there <laughs> <laughs> nice call back oh there's Carl and I mean everyone Oh, that guy. It's, it's <laughs> unbelievable. The story of my life. And the strange thing is there's not a sad face to be found. Everyone is just so glad to see you. And send you off right. Goodbye, everybody. Farewell, adieu. <laughs> Great image right there. You are a tall tale. You are larger than life. Right, and we're gonna embrace that about you instead of trying to bring you down to earth because that's not what you're meant for. Well, and I wonder if he suffered from not feeling like he was big enough for his family. Hmm. Maybe he wants to be a hero in his son's eyes, and so he feels like he has to spin these stories instead Absolutely. of just being. This is this is a Tim Burton film that even people who don't like Tim Burton films <laughs> it's, can like. It's sort of the least Tim Burtony Tim Burton. <laughs> I mean, there's there's. He got his Burton all over it, but, yeah. <laughs> but not in the way that you typically think of as he a He got Tim his Burton, Burton all over it. <laughs> I like that. I mean, he's definitely got the, the flair and the artistic touches, but it's, it's not as dark and it's not as gothic. And for me, so many Burton films, and I, and I am a fan, especially of his earlier stuff, but it's, it's style over substance, right? You have to start with the script for this film, mm -hmm. which, you know, it's adapted from a novel, which is a beloved novel. It's, it's very good. And then it was adapted by a screenwriter named John August, whose mm -hmm. T-shirt I'm actually wearing from the Script Notes podcast. Shout out Script Notes. <laughs> uh, you know, so you start with a very, very good script. When you have a script that good, it's basically up to the director to not screw it up. And yeah. Tim Burton could have screwed it up if he'd gone, you know, full Batman on it or full Pee Wee Herman's Big Adventure. It looked like this. <laughs> Which I love, <laughs> but that would have been wrong, right? Yeah. There's, there's, that's not the correct tone for this. Josephine actually went to the Congo last year. Oh, so you know. So in Edward's story sequences, when he's telling his tall tales of daring, doing whatever, you get your you get your Tim Burton. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He's yeah. he's got. He even calls back to to his favorite thing, which is a big, convoluted contraption to make eggs in the morning. <laughs> He's got that in like every movie. Um, <laughs> it's very much a tale of two films. He makes two movies. One of them is Edward Bloom's movie. Yeah. And one of them is his son's movie. Yeah. yeah. Which it's is true. a very fact-based objective. The camera's not doing crazy things. It's relatively still. Mm -hmm. It's it's framed up nicely, but it's not flashy. Yeah. And the and the emotional beats feel very real and true and yeah. grounded. Like all these all these conversations we've been showing. And I like hear how it kind of brings the two together. It, in this final scene where he's telling an Edward Bloom story, it's his style, and I mean, and Edward Bloom's storytelling. Everyone. So the camera work is still much more staid and calm, even through the car chase. It's not an Edward Bloom car chase would have had cartoon taxis, and and this is you know it's a car chase and it's exciting, but it's. It's not crazy camera moves. It's not hyperactive editing. It's yeah. a lot more staid and just kind of like we're very smoothly moving. We're on it's a dollar bloom here. through the lens of his son. Exactly. I started talking about how sometimes we feel like our life is not extravagant enough. Right. That we want to make sure that we do something that's meaningful, that touches lives, that lives up to our potential. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest thing that I learned from 
big fish is if you are genuine and you touch lives, you are enough. Yeah. You don't have to be larger than life. And we see that at the funeral when like all these people, the scaled, the scaled down versions, but you can see that they are the people from the tall tales yes. show up and that Edward Bloom, just by virtue of being him, has touched lives. Yeah. 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 That's super powerful. And honestly, that's what we all want. Mm -hmm. We all want to know that this life that we lived was enough. Yeah. Your integrity, your kindness, your goodness matter more than how big of a splash you make. <laughs> you know? I wasn't even trying to tie that into fish, but it just happened. That's how fantastic. Beautiful. What a catch. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today, Stephanie. My thank you for pleasure. your insights mm -hmm. and uh, for having us rewatch this film that I hadn't revisited since it came out almost, what, 17 years ago. Yeah. So we'll put thank it back you in the spotlight. for this opportunity. Thank you. So if you want us to keep doing what we're doing, we need one thing from you. Hit that little share button down below and put in a good word for us on social media with your friends. So until next time, spin those tall tales, work at a circus, and, and watch movies. movies.